Are you suffering from trauma? Yes, victims of narcissistic abuse can experience trauma. There's so many different factors that go into it, and um, we need to learn to heal that trauma. Suffering is all like too common, and nobody talks about it, but it leaves us feeling alone and ashamed and vulnerable and disqualified from living a good life. But in some cultures, they actually believe that suffering is a rite of passage, a way to rise. My guest today is Lily Correll, and she's got a new book out there calling Resolve to Rise, Become Greater Than Your Circumstances. And this is exactly what we need to hear. My name is Tracy Malone. I'm the founder of NarcissistAbuseSupport.com. Today, we're going to talk about how to rise from the trauma with Lily. So let's welcome her. Hey, Lily, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. I am so excited. Have you ever lost something and then you couldn't find it again for a while? Absolutely. I have this pair of earrings that, that like just disappears for months and I go crazy and then I find it. Well, your book that I was reading and highlighting and showing my son this weekend <laughs> is just gone. So I can't hold it up. So, uh, you know, when, when we're ready, I want you to share your book with people because I'm like, I can't hold it up. And it's so beautiful. It is the most beautiful cover I've ever seen. And um, I'm so excited to talk to you today. But before we start about your talking about your resolve to rise, um, which is your new book that's coming out, um, can you talk about us and explain who this book is for? Absolutely. Um, I, I really believe that um, there's so many individuals out there that are suffering from abuse, whether it be narcissistic abuse or um, physical abuse um, or both. Honestly, I think a lot of times um, abuse comes with partners, if you will. Uh, you have physical abuse, you may have sexual abuse, you have narcissistic abuse. Um, and unfortunately, what happens is a lot of times folks basically align with the perpetrator of that abuse over the person who suffered the abuse. They actually look at those folks as individuals who are basically trying to disrupt kind of the harmony of everyone's relationships. And so instead of giving support to the person who suffered the abuse, oftentimes they're left on an island. And so as a result, I think a lot of times people are not sharing about the abuse that they've suffered. And so they sit in isolation and it oftentimes results in shame. So I, I wanted to write the book for folks who were like that to know that they are not alone, that there's a lot of us who have been through abuse and who have found kind of, as I said, obviously, as the title of my book, the resolve to rise, that um, abuse has impacts. There's absolutely no doubt. Mm -hmm. Um and that we were not alone and that a lot of people are suffering in similar ways to us. Yeah, I think that's so important. Thank you for telling us that. Because again, victims of abuse, they're just learning often, you know, about narcissistic abuse, about what happened, they're learning the terms and they're, they're building up their arsenal for validation. Mm -hmm. And then they get to the point where they're like, oh my God, I have all this trauma and I didn't even know it. And, and they're, they're shamed by that because how could I have stayed? How could I have not known? And so, you know, rising out of that is possible. Both you and I are, are bearing witness to that fact. So, um, you know, what inspired you to write this book? I... It's funny. I, I wouldn't say that at age 16, I knew I was going to write a book, but I will say um, at age 16, I really hit a wall. I, um, I had suffered a lot of trauma as I write to some of it in the book. And I had been able to dissociate myself from my feelings, from the impacts of that trauma, and really kind of go along like everything was fine. But around 14, 15, I, I wasn't able to really do that as well. And so I was looking for any way to just kind of numb out. I was drinking alcohol. I was um, having sexual relationships with sometimes my friends' boyfriends. I was um, just, I was on a mission to self-destruct, honestly. And 
I just kind of hit a wall. I think there, there was an event that happened that it was just felt so below what I thought my life was going to be about that. I just decided this is not how I want to live my life. Um, I want to heal. I want to be real about what's going on with me. Um, and so my dad had exposed me to 12 step programs. And so I started going and actually sharing honestly, rather than making stuff up <laughs> about what was going on. Um, and I started to heal and I started to listen and hear other people sharing my story only it was their story, but it was the same. And I, I started realizing that I wasn't as unique as I thought that I was and not unique in good ways. Like, Oh, you know, I'm, I have psychic abilities or something like that. I'm talking unique and like, I'm detestable and I hate myself and all of the, this inner crap that we, you know, internalize and then repeat. Um, and so I just, I started to realize that wasn't unique and that I was going to be okay because other people were experiencing it and they were moving through it. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, sorry, I think I forgot your question and I don't know <laughs> if you answered it. Well, what, what inspired you to write the book, which was yeah. the history of that? So I think ultimately it's it, what I've run into is people who are in a situation, whether it be um, abuse of some sort, it could be an autoimmune disease or a health condition or, or something where they seem like they're in this downward spiral and they feel victimized and they're unable to figure out how to move forward through that. Mm -hmm. I, I was really inspired to share that you can, that you're not irreparably damaged, that whatever situation you're in, you're not hopeless that you can move through it. And there is an ability to rise and to claim something better and to claim the very best parts of yourself. Yeah, I'm finding the, the parts. I related to your story so much. Everything's fine. I have a normal <laughs> life. I mean, my entire dialogue that I had as a child was false. Um, it was what my family sort of encouraged us to like, this is what we have. We have a house on the water with a yacht and a blah, 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 and everything's fine. And it was the most dysfunctional upbringing that anyone ever had. And yet we had to hold on to that. Everything is fine mantra, right? And the bad choices that you made really emulate and, and I could relate to them. I was a wild child. I actually had a license plate that said a wild one when I was <laughs> in the car. Um, and so it was, I just like, I pronounced that. And, and again, that was behind everything's fine, but mm -hmm. this is not the way that real life is. And when you have been through trauma, you actually have to heal this. So let's talk about like, tell them about Resolve to Rise, tell them about the book and, and what they're going to learn. Absolutely. I, I think, first of all, I, I really wanted to ground everyone in the fact that suffering happens. I, I think that sometimes people think, um, you know, that some people are immune to suffering. Mm -hmm. And so I did a deep dive on just some basic statistics to really help people understand suffering is happening in, in a large way. And probably most of the people that you interface with have gone through something tragic and difficult. And so, but we don't talk about it. So that keeps us isolated. So we need to, we need to have that courage. We need to listen to each other and hear for the opportunities to be able to share and to connect and to really help people come out of that kind of isolation. Um, the next thing was really just trying to help folks understand that trauma has impacts. And I'm not just talking about, it makes you feel bad and, oh, you're sad and, you know, oh, I'm more sensitive or I'm this way or that way. It actually changes your brain. Mm -hmm. And being able to heal from trauma requires oftentimes more than talk therapy. I get a little, that's probably not fair to say, I get a lot frustrated with my colleagues. Um, I think that um, my colleagues, other clinicians, sometimes will venture into spaces that maybe they're not as expert as, as they want to think that they are. Um, and to do talk therapy with an individual who suffered from trauma that already feels like they're irreparably damaged, and then they go through talk therapy, and let's say they're seeing this person, and it's a lovely person, and all of their other friends who see this person think she's fabulous, and they're not making progress. And so they have to assume it's them. 
they're the problem. They were right. They are irreparably damaged. The counselor who's so wonderful can't even help them. Um, so I want folks to understand that that's, that's really not true. There's actually um, therapeutic approaches that engage the body and the mind. Um, there's epigenetic uh, counseling. There is, um, you know, meditative types of practices. There's EMDR. I think a lot of people are familiar with, um, but there's a lot of approaches out there. So I wanted people to know you, you have trauma, you, you're starting to understand the impacts of it. What are the helpful approaches? Um, and, and really starting to be able to work through a process of identifying, like what, what are the impacts that I want to work on? How do I go about it, approaching working on those trauma impacts and healing? And then also I, I tried to kind of disperse throughout the book, take breaks, man. Don't just sit around and deep dive into your pain and remorse and shame and, um, have fun, like take breaks from it and go do fun things. Um, that doesn't mean you're any less earnest. And in fact, I think it, it helps actually to take a break um, and then kind of re-engage it. And the last thing I would just say is that the book is really also about um, that this is a continual journey. It's kind of like um, the woman that I reference in the book, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross has her five stages of grief that a lot of us are familiar with. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, when my husband died, who I referenced in the book, I thought, well, wait a second, I can't be feeling anger again, because I already worked through that part of the process, or I can't be feeling, you know, sadness or whatever. And it's, it, you know, none of these things are an exact science. It doesn't all happen in the same order. Each person's, as you well know, um, each person's impacts of trauma are different. We're all kind of snowflakes. We're uniquely wired and, and you know, um, different from each other. And so I, I really want folks to leave with just the instruction manual to keep that process going and to continue to re-engage in their resolve and move forward. Mm -hmm. And that's a beautiful thing. What you were saying about talk therapy, you know, I hear every day when I get people on that have been going to talk therapy mm -hmm. and it's keeping them in yesterday they're just rehashing 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 they're not going oh that's why and let's figure this out and bing 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 and so there are other ways to, to approach this i know in one of the chapters and again i don't have it in front of me because but i highlighted it and i did write it on my notes there was something about going on a bear hunt so tell me about that this is a children's rhyme, and um, I thought it was perfect. It, it says, you can't go over it, you can't go under it, you have to go through it. Mm -hmm. And um, Rosen, who's the author of that rhyme, repeatedly gives the reader or the person who's saying the rhyme um, examples of bad situations. And he just keeps saying, you can't go over it, you can't go under it, you have to go through it. And that is absolutely something that I have learned. And I think there's all kinds of people out there who say to themselves, I, I, I'm fine. I'm better if I don't deal with it. In fact, when I think about it, it makes me feel shameful. So I'm just not going to think about it. And I'm just going to push on through. Mm -hmm. um, what, what I have found is that when you try to kind of sidestep whatever's going on, that you actually end up more controlled by it rather than less. So um, in my book, you know, I give the example of my husband dying and I I was extremely fortunate to have a woman who came. I had barely lived in that town, I think a couple of months. Um, and so it was just amazing. She came, she basically walked me through this process. I was 25 years old. I, I was just literally in shock. I, I kept saying, I don't even know how many times I said, I'm only 25. I just kept saying, I'm only 25. Like somehow the universe understood, I'm only 25, that this would not be happening. Um, but she walked me through every step of the way and I was terrified, but she said, just keep going, Lily, go, you have to go into the room. You have to go strip the bed. We have to face this. And, um, I, my friend that was going through a very, not a similar thing in terms of, you know, the circumstances, but his wife had died at the hospital after birthing their child. Mm -hmm. And he was telling me how he literally drove out of his way to go places to avoid going by the hospital. So while he wasn't dealing with it and he was just moving on with his life, his life wasn't moving on without him avoiding at great 
effort to get away from being impacted by it, which, which reminds us that we never really can get away from it. So we need to take Rosen's advice and not try to go over it or under it, but go through it and understand that it's going to feel like crap when we're in it. But when we come out on the other side, we're going to be a little bit freer, a little bit lighter, and a little less affected by those things. Absolutely. It's, we have to get dirty. We have to play in the mud of, of, the, of the misery and, you know, feel it, experience it, understand it, um, mm -hmm. you know, because the whole everything is fine is, is the mantra that many people have to put up this face that, that keeps them from going through it. And mm -hmm. so, you know, facing it and going through it, I, when you said about your friend and the avoiding of the hospital, I wrote down, I'm like, oh my God, I avoided my mother's death hospital for like two years. I was just like, I think I'll go this way. And every time I still see it now, I'm better. And I get just like, that's where she died. And, and you know, like say a prayer, that's it. And I, I drive right by, but it it is something that we avoid. And I've always been an avoider. Um, and, and so many of us are uncomfortable sitting with their pain and their grief. Um, and they, they try to rush through it, like you said. We're going through it. We're like, phew, we're, we're just going around it. We're going to avoid it. But that does cause this kind of shame. So what can someone do when they're experiencing this um, or even witnessing somebody with this sort of pain? I... I find that it's extremely important to really meet the person where they are. I, um, I have so many stories, honestly, about, I'm not going to be very generous here, but idiotic things people say to people <laughs> that I'm like, I thought about writing a book. You can't make this beep up because it's unbelievable. Like I, I was seeing this client and she's telling me she had had I don't even know how many miscarriages. I think she was like a, an unbelievable amount. And the person said to her, well, at least you can get pregnant. I, yeah. Getting pregnant wasn't the goal. Having a child was the goal. So I think that sometimes we get uncomfortable with our own discomfort when other people are in pain and we want to hurry them up to feeling okay. And we, we've all heard anytime you go through the death of someone, someone in your life at some point is going to tell you it's going to be okay. It, it just, it's like a go-to message that, that helps people feel okay for themselves. Like I need Tracy for it to be okay for you because it's making me really uncomfortable that you're not okay. So can we hurry up and get okay? Um, and so I think that that's where it's like, just slow down and be present with people. And if it's bringing something up for you, work on that somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that means, sometimes it's people are joking and laughing and you're uncomfortable because you came in sad yeah. and you're like, what the heck? How, why are they laughing? If that's where they are, I think you need to just sit with them and let them be in that space and laugh with them and remember the good memories. And um, because you know, really honoring where people are really helps them to move to where they need to be. And it's, it's kind of like, you know, Rosen's um, comment about you can't go over, you can't go under, you have to go through it. It's, it's our tendency as a country to want to skip past it and, and to really avoid doing that and being present with people, I think is exceedingly important. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, you know, just being witness and, and letting them feel what they feel is really important. But I think you, you deserve one of these. My, you can't make this shit up. <laughs> because that's the title of my book. And as you were talking to, I also pulled out my dumbass card because people say dumbass things to us. They're just like, what are you saying? They do. And, and they don't mean to hurt us when they don't know how to handle trauma. And, you know, victims of narcissistic abuse, their friends and family don't understand because, oh, come on, he was so wonderful, or she's a great mom. How could you say that about her? You know, it, it, the dumb things that people say continue to injure us when we are in trauma. And Absolutely. look at those things as they aren't educated enough to understand how to help us and move forward. Um, I know in your book, you talked about your mom a lot and um, you made a, a point to say that you didn't want to indict her and, um, you know, that you actually had compassion for what she had indeed suffered herself. So you want to share a little bit about that? 
Yeah, I um, I mean, obviously, when I was growing up and the abuse was occurring, and um, I was, I was actually at more than angry at my mom. I was just terrified of her. I, I was, um, again, dissociative, like a lot of us are in our trauma. Um, and so I was just trying to appease her and, and make things okay. And then I think, you know, over time, as I got older and as, you know, we come into our teenage years, we get a little bit more, um, sometimes, uh, expressive, we'll just say. And I, I definitely had a period of anger. It was, I think more repressed. Um, I wasn't as aware of it. So I, I talk a little bit about in the book, I, I saw a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist said, you know, you're not, you don't have mental illness. You're pissed at your mom, basically. <laughs> And I was like, I just, I was so disconnected from what I was feeling that I didn't, I had no awareness that I was angry with my mom. Like it, it just, it really, I, I thought she was psychic or something. I mean, now looking back on it, I'm like, dumbass, it was really obvious. <laughs> but at the time I was like, wow, it's amazing. Um, and so it, it took a while, but I think as I got older and I realized that this is a woman who had a major mental illness, she had bipolar one with psychosis. She had suffered very, very difficult experiences from her mental illness. And then as I grew older, I learned in her life, some things that her parents did and sometimes didn't do um, mm -hmm. that were really damaging to her. And she was an amazing concert, almost concert pianist. She played for um, one of the university's choirs and she, she continued to play piano at like old age homes. And um, I just started to see, I think the things that were lovely about my mom started to show themselves a little bit more to me. And I started to appreciate the loss that she'd had and really living out uh, her best life and, and really finding joy and being able to celebrate the amazing person I think she really was because of what she had suffered. And, and so that really came with time um, and healing, I think, just understanding that. I, I did want to say, you know, the, the abuse I talk about in the book a lot of times was physical abuse. Um, I did talk about my father not really validating me. But I have to say, interestingly enough, the most impactful abuse has not been the physical abuse. It's really the narcissistic abuse. Mm -hmm. And um, it was abuse where you could, there was no way out, right? It, so if, if she would say to you, why did you call me a bitch? And I'd be thinking, I didn't, I didn't, <laughs> right? But if I said I didn't, then I got in trouble for lying. And if I said I did, I was in trouble because I called her a bitch, which I didn't do. And so there was a lot of these mind games that happened where I was in a no-win situation. I think clinically they call it like a double bind. Mm -hmm. um, and I, those are the things that still plague me today. But I think the difference is I don't feel angry with her about it because she had her own journey, right? That it, and she was broken and confused and, um, and I've been able to kind of just see her and her, you know, inability to, to really parent me in the way that really she should have. Yeah. Thank you. That's so important. The, the, you know, forgiveness and letting go compassion again, when you are in the fire pit and your narcissistic spouse is like creating chaos and, and your world is turned upside down, there's not a lot of place for forgiveness then, but you know, when it comes to our parents and, and, you know, letting go of that hurt that they caused us does happen easily when we see where they came from. It's no excuse. It's mm -hmm. not, you know, validating and going, it's okay because she was crazy. Mm -hmm. But it, it is also a point where, like, if we want to let go of that hurt that we had as a child, you know, to look at that. I had to look at my mother who, again, crazy narcissistic smacking us every day. We learned to dive bomb on the floor so she could <laughs> hit us as fast and tag team and like get her confused. Yeah. It was a game to avoid getting hit. And so when we look at that, I, I had to look at her, her history and she watched 
her mother gets shot and killed and then went to 27 or 26 foster care homes. She didn't know what a family was. She was insecure her whole life. She should have never had children. But again, when I found the compassion for that, the hatred that I held and the anger and all of the stuff just faded away. And so it is part of rising is to let go of the, the things like think of yourself as a hot air balloon and those sandy bags, you're just dropping them down so that you're letting go so that you can rise. There's a good uh, one. For you. <laughs> Cause again, yeah. so we're going to rise, right? It's going to work out. So before we go on to all of our little stories, I want you to tell us if there were a few things in this book, the most important things that people are going to learn, what would you say they are? I, again, I, I think um, that suffering is happening. Trauma, the amount of trauma that is occurring out there, the amount of abuse, the, it's unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've started to see you know, more and more reports of um, you know, sex trafficking and the gymnasts and the Catholic church and on and on and on. And I think our tendency is to think this is horrible this is horrible that, you know, all this is happening. Well, this has been happening. Let's be clear. It's been happening. We're starting to talk about it. That's why we're hearing about it. Not because it wasn't happening and now it's happening and oh my gosh, we're going in this terrible way. It's been happening and now we're giving voice to it. So, so that's the first part. I think that once we give voice to it, there's an opportunity to start changing the narrative. And I think the word narrative has taken on a whole new, um, new meaning for me as I've dealt with my own, the own narcissist in my life, um, just in terms of understanding that how damaging a, a, a narrative can be, mm-hmm. but also how equipping a narrative can be mm-hmm. and really um, being aware of what we're telling ourselves about, um, you know, our ability to rise and then investing in ourselves. I think the, the last thing is just the project that you're working on is you mm-hmm. and it is good and it is worthy. The reality is with my mom is that at some point, whether I want to or not, the accountability has to shift mm-hmm. from her to me because guess what? I have children now and who knows what they're going to say in their counseling sessions. <laughs> so I got to do the best I can to not just work through and resolve my own stuff, but to, but to give myself grace through that process and continue to invest in it because the project is me and I'm now accountable. My mom is not, my mom has been gone for however many years. She's not the one who's telling me I'm a worthless piece of crap. When that message is replaying, I am, Mm -hmm. and I don't want my children to grow up seeing a role model that thinks that I'm not good enough, which means they're not good enough. Mm. So I gotta, I gotta take on that accountability. The exciting thing is, and this is the, I think the last thing to to take away is that with that, if once you take that accountability on, you're in the driver's seat. Like, isn't that what we say about like, whether it's narcissistic abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse, whatever it is, it puts us as an unwitting passenger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and we're not in control of where it's going. Mm-hmm. And the whole movement out there about trauma-informed care is about giving people back the control. Mm-hmm. Well, we have to take that, right? And then do something with it. So I, I'm just really, I'm excited about this time that we're going through, that we're talking about these things. Mm-hmm. I can't even tell you since I've been writing the book, how many times I've heard people randomly, like completely out of context, reference their trauma. It's amazing. So I think there's just such a great opportunity for healing. I hope we'll take that. There is. And I think if they read your book, it's going to help them directionally just get that way. Like think things differently. Again, holding on to, you know, he did this, she did that, whether it's mom or (laughs) husband or whatever. um, We do have to say, you know what? I don't want to hold that anymore. I have to change the recording, as you said, in my mind to, you know, I'm not a worthless piece of shit. Um, I, I am not not good enough. Um, you know, let go of those feelings and, and let go of those things and step up into your life because that's mm-hmm. the only way you take it back is by going, 
that's old and I want this. And I think that the, the part that people miss here is, is planning what that next chapter looks like. Mm-hmm. Often to go, I don't know who I was. I don't know what I am. I, you know, I'm like, all right, well, what do you want it to be? It's like a business plan. And then you take steps to get to it as slowly or as fast as you can, because that's what we do. And um, I'm so grateful and thankful for you to come and visit and talk with us Thank today. You. you hold up the picture of the book because I yes. wish I had it in front of us. Yeah. And of course it had, they haven't printed it yet. So this is what I have. This is the cover of Resolve to Rise. So cool. I want one of those little free me things when I get my book done. <laughs> hey, if they don't give you one, let me know. I'll make one for you. Ooh, she's great. You can't make it for yourself. Somebody else has to make it. Oh, for you. okay. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Lily. It has been a pleasure meeting you and talking with you. And I know everyone's going to really help themselves so much by getting Resolve to Rise. I'll put the link down below um, as soon as it's available and we'll get people over to reading it. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a great day. Wasn't she great? I'm so glad we got to interview her and bring her wealth of knowledge to all of you. So go and check out the link. We'll put it down below when the book launches and um, visit my website, NarcissistAbuseSupport.com. If you haven't been there, we have so many resources for you. Um, We have 10 free eBooks and, you know, where to find support groups and, you know, where to find a lawyer if you can't afford one. There's so much information that we've been gathering for you. And um, I hope to see you soon. Thanks.